Welcome again to the paboardreview.org wiki review on the overall function of the heart. I wanted to create a wiki review that I could have as a central reference to cardiology when creating other wiki reviews. There will be revisions and additions as this topic is brought in a major focus on the pants and pan ray. Given our background and training, I will go through at a swift pace to keep this review quick and to the point. We will review the normal physiology of the functioning heart, look, to, look at the electrical, mechanical, and cellular components that are referred to when dealing with the pathophysiologies related to the heart. When creating this video, I was amazed at the number of subtle details that I've forgotten. In other words, I never really learned. I remember the lecture where I heard the statement, no cell is more than a three cell distance away from a capillary. The professor had us kind of stop and think about that. And it's been profound, but it's also helped to put things into context when I'm thinking about the importance of a certain organ or the role it plays. So the heart must deliver oxygen, nutrients, and take away waste from trillions of cells every second most important to our cognitive experience, i.e. the neurons of our CNS and PNS. Remember the heart starts to practice pumping while it's still in the womb and must continue its function with only a small amount of rest in between what we call systole and diastole. The heart responds to increased demands and even provides its services during sleep. When you look at all the path pathological stresses that we, and the phys psychological stresses that we put on this organ, no wonder why the morbidity and mortality associated with heart disease is a major problem in our developed country and why we need to understand it. The heart must perform the following functions. One, it must generate an action potential or electrical signal that is intrinsic to the heart, the SAAV node. It also must be able to receive and respond to outside influences, i.e. parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system, hormones, volume, the vascular tone, kidney function, etc. The action potential or signal must be generated in the heart, have its own pacemaker, and it is to travel through the heart in a well-timed manner. The timing or the speed at which the action potential or signal travels is referred to velocity, the electrical signal is then to be translated into an adequate mechanical force within the atrial and or ventricles when needed. The contraction must be a sufficient force to move against the blood's opposing pressures, i.e. the atrial venous pressures, etc. Sometimes the force of muscle contraction is referred to as inotropic or inotrope. The coordination of electrical stimulation and muscle contractions must then be able to pump or supply blood adequately to the tissue's um, demands. That is cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. The heart, the pump also must maintain the integrity of the blood, i.e. not clot and or lose the ability to have, its, have it carry oxygen within that blood medium. As I was creating this wiki review uh, to make sure we all have the same understanding, I felt it important to create a quick review on how the electrical activity of the heart is measured and the concepts behind it. A voltmeter measures the potential or difference in ion concentration between two containers. Imagine, if you will, a roll of paper being moved behind a voltmeter with a pen writing at the level associated with a certain voltage. The strip of paper would generate lines at a given voltage on the y-axis and the x-axis would be used as time. The stronger the depolarization or the stronger the voltage, the higher the line will appear on the paper. As the voltage decreases, the line would appear lower on the paper. Because we have a battery and it's not under a load, it will usually measure a steady voltage here at 9 volts. The 12 leads are placed on the skin in the pattern shown above. We can look at the placement of leads in this pattern to help us conceptualize how the ECG machine uses the leads. The idea is to generate an electrical picture of the heart in a coronal plane. 
and also generate an electrical picture of the heart in a transverse plane and gives one a 3D electrical picture or activity of the heart. Let's not kid ourselves, the interpretation of EKG readings is a skill that takes a lot of time, a lot of reading of EKGs, and you also need somebody who can help you know if you're interpreting them correctly, along with the clinical picture. But I think understanding the concepts of how it works will help us to better understand the whys and what we're really looking at. More on this in a, another Wikipedia. The ECG machine will automatically measure the polarity between different leads simultaneously. For example, to get lead 1, AVR and AVL will be recorded. The depolarization is recorded as a positive deflection upward as the millivolts travel toward the LV AVL lead. Remember, the PQRS complex is a sum of all the small and large electrical activities of the heart. Take a look at the leads AVR. It's the mirror image of lead 1. Why? Because the ECG machine changes the polarity of the leads and changes the direction in which it measures the depolarization. It's like watching a car travel 500 yards towards you and you record your observations and then you watch the car pass and drive 500 yards away from you and record the observation. The other leads are an interpretation from different angles from one another. Like I said, lots of information goes in the EKG in general. For this lecture, I wanted to introduce the concepts be behind the ECG as a reference and a springboard into other wiki reviews. We will review the atrial ventricular node, or the AV node, and its role in coordinating the contractions between the atria and the ventricles. On the right, you can see the electrical signature of the AV node and I put it exactly above the PQRS complex seen on an EKG. It's not of a significant current or signal to show up on EKG. It's silent. It's of slow conducting properties, meaning it will slow down when it hits this node, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. We'll then review the bundle branches into Purkinje fibers and also the coordination and contractility of the ventricles and their relaxation and how they are related to the bundle branches and Purkinje fibers. Again, we have the electrical signal above the PQRS T complex seen on EKG. It's part of the QRS complex um, and it happens so quickly they're kind of stacked on each other but we'll talk about that a little bit also. We will then look at the electrical signals and how they are translated into mechanical force within the ventricles and how um, they contract and relax, depolarize and um, repolarize. To the right is a sum of all the normal electrical signals of the heart and how they form the PQRS complex on the EKG. The heart both sends input to the CNS via baroreceptors located in the aortic arch, chemoreceptors in the carotid sinuses. We also have a unique group of cells that are part of the cardioregulatory center located in the medulla that monitor the oxygen concentration in the blood after the blood-brain barrier that precisely reflects the O2 content at the alveolar capillary level returning to the heart. The heart also receives input from outside stimulus, i.e. the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system, hormones, volume of the blood, vascular tone, and there are a lot of others. Our, our heart also makes adjustments through the constant changing demands of our environment. It also must supply itself with oxygenated blood while delivering nutrients and other components that are necessary in disposing of waste. If we take a step back and look at the heart in the context of the other organ systems, we can see the complex interplay between the heart and the other organs. A couple things I wanted to point out are the renin angiotensin aldosterum system, which we covered in another wiki review, uh, the vascular system, the hepatic portal system, the neurological inputs, and then also the, the uh, hormonal influence on the vascular system. 
The pericardial sac provides protection and a friction-free environment within the chest cavity. We'll talk about the pieces of that in a second here. Let's look at a cross-section of the cardiac wall and the pericardium located in the ventricle. In the most outer layer of the pericardium is a dense fibrous connective tissue surrounding the parietal pericardial layer. Pericardial fluid or serous fluid that creates the lubricant to slide over is in the pericardial cavity. A single layer of simple squamous epithelium lines the most medial layer of the parietal pericardium. Another layer of connective tissue which makes up the outermost layer of the endocardium and the inner layer of the visceral pericardium. The myocytes connective tissue, glue holding everything together, artery veins, Purkinje fibers, and others make up the components of the heart wall. There's another layer of connective tissue lined with a simple squamous epithelium that makes up the innermost layer of the heart wall called the endocardium collectively. This thin smooth layer of uh, cells can be thought of as as a Teflon that reduces friction which decreases coagulability of the blood which allows for the pumping of the blood without causing any problems. Remember just after the SA node the conducting fibers referred to as right and left bundle branches travel down through the septum then up turn upward and internally in the ventricles the Purkinje fibers then travel from the deep to superficial myocytes or inside to outside. Note the septal bundle branches are represented in this illustration and as a single unit but can be divided into right, left, even anterior depending on the uh, anatomy of that particular heart depending on how deep detailed you want to be. The electrical deep polarization signal travels from deep to superficial myocardium or from the myocytes closest to the cavity outward. When thinking of the heart wall, we need to think of it in terms of thickness or density. Our normal heart wall is thicker in the left ventricle than the right because of the forces it is working with or against. For example, you can have a partial thickness infarction if you put someone with severe coronary artery occlusion under conscious sedation sitting in one position for a long period of time, meaning the cells closest to the endocardium, innermost wall, will die, but those on the superficial or outer layer of the heart will be preserved. T-tubules or transverse tubules allows electrical signals or action potentials to travel the thickness multiple layers of the myocardium. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a system that stores calcium. They run throughout the myocytes and are located right next to the actin and myosin fibers. By placing the calcium right next to the site of action, we can increase and decrease this effect quickly and efficiently. The individual myocytes are bifurcated and allow for the transmission of a single action potential to many action potentials. The myocytes connect through their intercalated discs which serve to create more surface area thus increasing transmission speed. These junctions also have tough connective junctions which allows for the coordinated movement without ripping apart upon contracting and relaxing. Myocytes have many nuclei, mitochondria, and other supporting organelles to provide the support for the high output and energy requirements of the heart. The actin and myosin filaments are arranged along the long axis of the cell and provide the mechanical contracting and relaxing forces within the heart. We're going to look at each component more closely now. We will look at the cardiac cycle starting with the depolarization of the SA node. Cells closest to the SA node are stimulated first. The action potential or electrical signal travels from the right to the left in the atrium. A small vector is generated leftward as seen in the upper tracing. The vector travels at a moderate velocity. The first electrical event is small and does not appear or register on the EKG. One of the purposes of the SA node is to signal and coordinate the contractions of the atria to kick blood into the ventricles at the right moment before the ventricles contract. The SA node and the AV node are referred to as pacemaker cells because they initiate, initiate, coordinate, and pace the cardiac output. This is referred to as a 
as spontaneous depolarization. If I were to take the SA node and place them in a petri dish in a compatible extracellular fluid environment, they would by themselves undergo spontaneous depolarization in a predictable repeatable pattern. The AV node undergoes spontaneous depolarization, but in a normal heart, it takes its cue from the SA node and it transmits the, that electrical impulse at a medium velocity onto the bundle branches. If it doesn't, if the AV node does not receive a stimulus from the SA node, it will pace at a lower um, depolarization or spontaneous depolarization than the SA node. So leaky sodium-gated channels located on the cell membranes allow the sodium to leak into the cell, allowing the membrane potential. The membrane potential, remember, is the difference between the sum of the outside ion concentration, electrical charges, and compared to those on the inside of the cell. So well, the sodium, leaky sodium channels allow the action or the membrane potential to reach the threshold. Now the remember the uh, leaky sodium channels are different than fast sodium gated channels. Keep that in mind. Once the membrane potential reaches threshold, ion gated calcium channels open quickly causing an influx of calcium into the cells and generate an action potential. The action potential is propagated to the atrial myocytes from right to left. A quick note on calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers are of two classes dihydropyridines, DHPs, and non-dihydropyridines, non-DHPs. Vascular smooth muscle have what are called L-type calcium channels, while the myocardium has molecularly different calcium-gated ion channels. So there are only a few clinically significant cardiac selective calcium channel blockers. One is verapamil, and it's known to be in a phenylalkylamine class. It's relatively selective for the myocardium and less effective as a systemic vasodilator. It's used to treat arrhythmias, um, also angina, and it does uh, it reduces angina by decreasing the myocardial oxygen, to, oxygen demand and reversing coronary um, vasospasms. Diltiazem is in what's called a benzothiazepine class and it's intermediate between verapamil and DHP calcium channel blockers, so it has effect on both. It has some overlap. And then we have DHP calcium channel blockers because they're highly selective for the L-type the L calcium channels on smooth muscles throughout your whole body. And it's used to primarily reduce systemic vasovascular vascular resistance. And some examples, and they have the suffix P-I-N-E, pines, are amlodipine, nicardipine, philodipine. Okay, back to the SA node. After depolarization is complete, voltage-gated potassium channels open, allowing positive ions to exit the cell, bringing the membrane potential back to the resting state. The leaky sodium channels will then start to process all over again. The oxygen delivered by the heart and the body's oxygen demands are constantly changing, so we have mechanisms built in to either increase or decrease the rate at which our heart will pump, meaning to increase or decrease the frequency of action potentials. Remember, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. This is a very busy slide and I've decided to, ref to defer some of the mechanisms that increase or decrease the action potential, but if you look, if you want to look at this slide, I've added the G-stimulatory inhibitory pathways as well as the mechanism of action for atropine as a beta-1 muscarinic type 2 on the beta-1 muscarinic type 2 receptors. More on this in the antiarrhythmic Wikipedia. Typically, healthy hearts have only two audible heart sounds called S1 and S2. The first heart sound, S1, is the sound created by the closing of the atrioventricular valves during ventricular contractions and is normally described as lub. The second heart sound, S2, is the sound of the semilunar valves closing during ventricular diastole and is described as dub. There are many ways to artificially or pathologically change the timing so the pulmonary and the aortic valves close asynchronously. Joe has an excellent lecture on murmurs. One example that Joe gives in lecture to describe how to 
increase the murmurs of the mitral valve prolapse but decrease the murmurs of hyper, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is by performing the hand grip maneuver uh, for 20 to 30 seconds. So sustained hand grip increases the mean arterial pressure. Joe tells us to remember that it's like placing blood pressure cuffs on the patient's um, arteries. To listen to the S2, the aortic valve can be best heard at the right second intercostal space and the pulmonic valve at the left second intercostal space. Once the ventricles are filled, the right and left atria contract, sometimes referred to as an atrial kick. Now we'll look at the cardiac myocytes at the cellular level. We will describe how we receive an action potential or electrical signal and then how that is translated into a mechanical muscle contraction. This applies to both the atrial and ventricular myocytes. This illustration represents a cardiac myocyte. Most cells spend energy maintaining a resting membrane potential. Myocytes maintain a resting membrane potential mainly through sodium and potassium ATPase and sodium and calcium exchangers. The, tr the tracing to the right represents the cycle of a myocyte and the change in membrane potential is designated in phases such as 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 as seen to the right. The myocytes receive an action potential or AP from the SA node or from adjacent myocytes. The AP travels on the surface and then down the T tubules or transverse tubules. You have to remember the cardiac wall or stacks of myocytes and if the action potential is traveling on the surface or um, Purgingi fibers closer to the um, ventricles or uh, inside of the atriums, the action potential needs to be dispersed throughout all of the myocytes to get a coordinated contraction and it's done through these T-tubules, transverse tubules. The AP triggers, fa triggers fast sodium gated channels to open allowing an influx of sodium to enter the cells. The resting membrane potential is brought to threshold. The sodium gated channels then close and voltage gated calcium channels open and calcium enters the cell causing an action potential to be propagated. Phase zero on the right represents threshold being reached and then the action potential. After the action potential, potassium gated channels open. You'll notice that there is a plateauing of the membrane potential in phase one and two. This occurs because of a little change in the ion concentration or the membrane potential. The purpose is to allow for a steady forceful contraction of the heart. You can see the difference when comparing the normal membrane potential of the heart to that of, let's say, atrial fibrillation. Keep this in mind when, when you're looking at AFib. The heart is not pumping in a well-coordinated sequence with the appropriate velocity if this plateauing, this pause, is not occurring. As calcium is increasing intracellularly, this causes a calcium spark. Calcium is released from the SR or sarcoplasmic reticulum via, excuse the pronunciation, ravenodine receptor channels. The calcium released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum allows the myosin heads to attach to the active site on the actin. In the presence of ATP, myosin cross bridge is released to reset. This causes the mechanical shortening of actin myosin filaments, or in other words, muscle contractions. If calcium continues to be present, another cycle of contractions will occur. Sodium and calcium exchangers along with sodium and potassium ATPases return the membrane potential to resting the resting state that you'll see in phase three to the right. Calcium is also pumped back into the SR for storage. Relaxation of cardiac muscles occurs in the absence of calcium. Here I place the steps for the myocyte activity in one place so that it's easier to review. Let's look at the differences between pacemaker cells and myocytes. The SA and AV nodal cells undergo a spontaneous depolarization because of the leaky sodium channels. The myocytes must rece receive stimulation to undergo depolarization through fast sodium channels. SA nodal cells move at a moderate velocity or speed, AV nodal cells at a slow velocity, and the bundle branches Purkinje fibers at a high velocity. 
The myocytes take the electrical signal or action potential and transform them into mechanical muscle contractions. We can use the small differences in channel types and different cell types to determine or decide, for example, which antiarrhythmic drugs or how we want to use or how they work. Class 1 antiarrhythmic drugs work on fast sodium channels. Lidocaine is in this class and if we use lidocaine IV, it changes the amount of stimulus it takes to initiate the depolarization of myocytes. So it moves the threshold um, up. The SA and AV nodal cells are virtually untouched by lidocaine. More on this in other reviews, but keep the differences and attributes in mind um, so you can learn the process and how um, different uh, diseases affect the uh, myocytes, ASA, AV nodes, and um, how we can apply them during the pants or pan ray or even in practice. The AV node is comprised of a small amount of tissue. The vector is slow, small, and electrically silent on ECG. A fibrous layer of tissue separates the atria from the ventricles, forming an insulated barrier. In a normal functioning heart, the AV nodal pathway is the only electrical pathway from the atria to the ventricles. Depolarization travels down the left and right bundle branches located in the septum. For illustration purposes, the bundle branches are depicted as one tract, but in reality can be composed of right, left, and even anterior um, branches of the uh, bundle branches. Depolarization travels to the right and left ventricles. Depolarization travels from the deep innermost myocardium to the outermost myocardium via the Purkinje fibers. In the ventricles, the membrane potential is turned into mechanical contractions pumping the blood. The first heart sound, S1, is the sound created by the closing of the atrioventricular valves during ventricular contractions and is normally described as lub. The coronary arteries supply blood flow to the myocardium. We will go into more detail during the ischemic heart disease series. The heart both sends and receives input to adjust to constant changing demands. There's a lot of information in this Wikipedia. There will be revisions as I perfect this wiki review. I hope this helps you in understanding, in your understanding of cardiology um, and it can be a springboard in later discussions. I know it's helped me in preparing and presenting this information. Thank you.